Okay, uh, today we're going to talk about, as Kyle said, the small-scale orchard disease management. And I'm going to focus today on apples and peaches. And you can kind of look at the apples as representing the palm fruit. So those will be uh, the pears and the apples primarily. And then the peach will represent the stone fruit. And that will primarily, you know, represent anybody that has peaches, plums, uh, and cherries. So we'll use those as our examples throughout the day. Um, as we're moving through this as well, some, one of the things for those of you who are sitting in that are either um, home growers or uh, another term would be non-commercial, I want to point out that you can use the spray guide that commercial growers use. And in fact, I actually recommend it because this is a really good spray guide that tells you when the pest problems need to be uh, controlled at what stage, how early you need to start doing control, when you should be looking for it. The trick with it is is knowing uh, if you're using home or non-commercial products, which ones you can use. So um, I made a copy uh, out of the front spray guide. You can see at the bottom of the page I've shown where you can actually download uh, a PDF version of this if you don't want to have a hard copy. So this is available on the web. You can either uh, uh, write this down or you can just get on Google and type in 2014 Midwest Tree Fruit Spray Guide and, and you will come to the, the web page that has the link. Now what I usually do because I work with both homeowners and commercial growers is a lot of times I'll go through the spray guide and you can see where I highlighted uh, with a marker on which products um, have an equivalent on the home market. So you can see that the top, well maybe you can't because it's kind of small, but the block in the top are, are what the pesticides that are labeled for apples are and you can see where the orange is. Those are the products that have an equivalent on the home market. And the same then for the block below that is for uh, stone fruit specifically uh, for peach as well. So you can see that there are quite a few commercial products available and much less so on the home market. And to the right you can see that I'm listing which ones are the main ones that you're going to be able if you do a little bit of looking. So as I go through this list, Captan is going to be readily available in, in most garden centers. Mancozeb, though, um, you're going to have to look for it. And unfortunately, even though it's really good on some apple and peach, pro, um, peach diseases, for whatever reason, they did not label it on the home version for uh, peaches and apples. So they only added the grape label. One of the other ones that you might not be familiar with, the actual active ingredient is mycobutanil. Uh, on the commercial market it's known as Rally. On the home market it's called Spectricide Immunox. And so again, um, if you're not opposed to using conventionally derived uh, pesticides, the uh, mycobutanil uh, is a really good one to have as well. For those who are uh, organic, I have on my list sulfur and fixed copper. And again, one of the other conventionally derived ones that's very common on the uh, garden centers or is chlorthalonil. On the commercial market, it's called Bravo. So let's go ahead and look at these and how they're used. Let's look at some of the specific diseases. So let's start with uh, the apple diseases first. You know, if you're looking to reduce the amount of pesticides, whether they're uh, organically uh, approved or whether they're conventionally derived, one of the things that you can do is, is grow some uh, apple cultivars that have some degree of resistance. And I've listed some here that I consider to be actually a fairly good quality, uh, regardless of whether you're organic or not. And so I've listed Pristine, Red Free, Gold Rish, and Pixie Crunch. And you can see here that the main thing that they're resistant to, uh, BR stands for very resistant to apple scab. Uh, HS is uh, highly susceptible. So if you look at gold rush, you can see that it's highly susceptible to cedar apple rush. Um, and R means resistant, S means susceptible on there. And so B is for very, uh, M is for moderate, and uh, so you can kind of look through that chart. So um, as I say, you know, when we first started coming out with these disease resistant apples, I didn't think that the quality of them or the eating quality of them were was that uh, good. In fact, most of the other apple uh, cultivars were superior. But these that I've listed here are actually quite good, so I would readily add them to, um, you know, any uh, type of orchard, home, commercial, organic, non-organic. 
I also want to list here again, these are the products that if you're trying to be organic, these are the ones that are going to be the main ones that you're going to rely on. I'm going to mention a couple others as we go through, um, but uh, sprayable sulfur, liquid lime sulfur, um, basic copper sulfate that you would use to mix with lime to make uh, Bordeaux mixture, so, um, or you can use the fixed coppers as well. So I have um, uh, uh, a link here to UC D Davis about some of the um, Bordeaux information. So if you're interested in making Bordeaux, uh, that's what this link is, is to a nice little article that describes Bordeaux very well. So let's start with our first disease. Uh, the first one that I want to mention in apples is fire blight. Fire blight is a bacterial disease, and for that reason, fungicides do not work on it. What you need to have uh, if you're using conventional products is an antibiotic. For those who are homeowners, the Fertilone brand, and it does, uh, the active ingredient is streptomycin. Now, when you're using um, these products, you need to use them properly. And as we move on to the next slide, I'm going to tell you where the timing is for applying this. You know, if you have not bloomed out right now and you've had some fire blight problems, you might want to look at getting uh, a copper spray on your trees at this point. Now, copper can be a very toxic or phytotoxic uh, component, so it acts as a biocide. The uh, copper ions themselves um, are very good um, eradicant, uh, but this, the downside is, is that it cause, can cause severe injury to green tissue. And so that's where uh, in the previous slide, I mentioned what you um, do if you're working with copper sulfate is that you add lime to it to create Bordeaux, and that stabilizes the copper ions. Or the other option that you have is you use one of the fixed coppers, and I'll go into a little more detail about that as well. So again, if you have apple trees and you've had some um, fire blight problems, you want and you're not um, butted out yet, you probably want to go out and, and do some copper sprays on the tree to help clean up any overwintering that might be on the outside of the tree. Now as we move into bloom, then we're going to move to a product that is uh, the active ingredient is streptomycin. This is an antibiotic. And I have a note here that uh, if you're following organic principles, uh, streptomycin is uh, allowed in organic production. So it is an option that you can write in when you're growing highly susceptible fire blight um, uh, cultivars. This is something that you're going to want to have in your organic plan that, that is an option if you're, you're willing to do so. So when we look at fire blight, um, I have a couple of pictures of what it looks like. The one that's the upper picture, you can see uh, the shoot, what it looks like. It kind of looks like a shepherd's hook if you looked at it close, closely. So the tip is always tipped over and, and kind of looks like a hook. Uh, fruit that's infected will just look black and, and dried up. And this is, uh, both of these pictures are on pear. So when you're looking at fire blight, fire blight is a bacterial disease that only affects members in the rose family. And unfortunately, most pears are highly susceptible. And we have several apple cultivars that are, are very susceptible too. The ones that come you know, to mind quick uh, are gonna be Jonathan um, and Fuji. Both of those uh, are very susceptible to fire blight. Uh, when we're looking at infection, uh, periods or an infection event are when we get temperatures that are in the mid uh, to upper 60s. So I have at the lower end of the slide that window of 65 to 86 degrees. Um, when we have an entry point, and that's usually when the trees are in bloom, or when there's been some uh, wounding event like a hailstorm, and then uh, combine that with a rain event. So when we're looking at doing a strep spray. Let's say you have your strep in hand and you're kind of watching the weather and you're, you've got all three things. The temperature is high enough, it's above 65 degrees, you're getting ready to have a rain event and uh, the trees are in full bloom. Now the way strep works is that it has to be applied before infection. So strep actually is a protectant. Uh, it is not a curative, so it needs to be on before infection. At the very latest, it can be put on no later than 24 hours after what you deem to be the infection event. So this has to be very timely on its application. Now, 
you might have to put uh, more than one application on too. So um, if, if you're looking at um, multiple effect, infection events, let's say that you have pretty um, long bloom period because of the cultivars that you have planted, uh, this is something that you might in, in a bad year uh, might have to put you know, two to four sprays on. But again, the key point here is that the strep needs to be put on ahead of time. Now, uh, commercials that have a large enough plant planting to justify it will, will have um, monitors out in uh, the orchard that will give them information to tell them uh, whether it's likely that they're in, at an infection event. But if you just keep in mind, temperatures above 65, trees are in bloom or you've had uh, a hail event, for example, and rain was involved, then you need to uh, be getting the strep out for application. Now, if you're organic um, and you don't want to use strep, you do have a couple other options here. Now, I have copper, and when we're talking about copper, we're, we're uh, either using it as a Bordeaux or we're using one of the fixed coppers, and I'm showing you some of the uh, home versions of copper. Uh, the tall canister comes in a dry formulation that can be used either as a dust or it can be mixed with water. Uh, the, um, the smaller containers are, are liquid formulation, they just are mixed in water on that. So some of the um, timing on that um, for copper would be prior to quarter inch green. So this is something, as I already mentioned, is, is can be uh, phytotoxic to the plant. So I have a note here that if you continue past that point, um, you will um, have russeting on your fruit. So if russeting is acceptable to you, um, then you can continue on uh, with uh, fixed copper or Bordeaux on the trees. And um, I've already mentioned about the strep comment, so we'll go ahead uh, at this point. So here's my notes on copper. Um, I guess you're probably going to get across that I, I want to make sure that you're very, being very careful uh, with the use of copper because of its phytotoxicity. And when we get to peaches, um, they are extremely um, sensitive to copper, so you have to take very much care on when you're applying that as well. But here's just a little background so you understand. Um, copper sulfate, uh, what we call blue stone or blue vitriol, um, is highly soluble in water. And that's really the cause of the to toxicity problems uh, with copper uh, when we spray it that way. And, you know, over 150 years now, they found that adding lime um, was actually, you know, when they added it, they added it to put a white coating on and, and add, add it as a sticker. But with some research, they found out that the lime actually safened uh, copper sulfate. And so a lot of the formulas uh, for making bluestone, if you go to that link that I gave you earlier, um, will be anywhere from um, two times the amount of lime to copper or, uh, or a one-to-one -one mixture. And so I'm giving an example of a one-to-one -one on how it would be written. So it would be a 10-10-100. Uh, this would be 10 pounds of copper to 10 pounds of lime to 100 gallons of water. Uh, so if you're spraying a small amount, then you can just scale it down from that. Uh, so if you were a one gallon, you know, it would be one one-hundredths of, you know, 10 pounds and one one-hundredths 10 pounds of, of uh uh, lime as well. So it can just be scaled down using that formula. So what about these insoluble copper compounds? These are what we call fixed coppers, and I've given several examples of those. And these are the ones that most growers use this day so that they don't have to mess with lime. And so if you use one of the fixed coppers there, lime is usually not added to this. If you were to add lime to this, it would add an additional level of, of safety for using copper. Um, but as I say, uh, it's usually not added. One note about copper, though, when you have cold or prolonged wetness, you know, it's very humid outside and cold, that's when we see the most amount of copper injury because it does increase solubility of the copper, and so we get an increased phytotoxicity. So uh, in years where we've had a really cold, wet spring is when we will see some copper injury on some plants. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. 
Let's move on to scab. Scab is, uh, you know, a, a real serious problem in apple production, um, both home and commercially. If you're not growing uh, scab re resistant varieties, now uh, as we go through this today, I'm going to assume that. Uh, if you have the commercial spray guide, you can look at the other options besides the ones that I am telling for home growers and for organic growers. So keep in mind that if you are using commercial products, they are all listed in the commercial spray guide. So you can go beyond what I'm talking about today. But today I want to make sure that um, you know those that are using um, small or, or non-commercial products that they know which ones are available. So when we're looking at SCAB, um, ones that ha uh, one that would be rated as excellent control would be the Microbutanil, and then I have it pictured here. It's the Spectricide Immunox Multipurpose Fungicide. One that would be rated as good would be Captan, and I don't have that pictured here. Uh, it usually is packaged as a dry material. And one note, if you have not worked with Captan, I want to make sure that you know to not follow closely with oil. And that means before or after. And we usually, for a safety margin, will say a two-week window. Uh, so you had uh, insect control by Rick Weinzerl, and he was talking about uh, dorma oil sprays um, or summer oil sprays for any of the, the scale, mite control, things like that. Um, if CAPTAN is in your program, you want to make sure that you have a rotation that CAPTAN is not within two weeks of any of your oil spray. So keep that in mind as well. Now I have another note, and we had this happen quite a bit in the Northeast this past year. Um, we had some rusting problems with CAPTAN, and again, it seemed to be uh, related to um, when a surfactant was used that caused excessive wetting. And so again, those surfactants that really um, let the, the captan sit on the fruit for a long period of time, there wasn't dry down, uh, we did see some rustening on that. And there's been a lot of examples on other products. Usually when we see emulsifiable uh, concentrates, uh, we'll see the same thing, that if uh, conditions are that the fruit is very slow to dry after pesticide application, we'll see some rusting as well. So again, just make a comment that captan cap is one, um, not, it, not most of the time, but occasionally we'll see some rusting as a result. Um, if you're organic and you're using sulfur, um, again, it, it is rated as spare for scab control. I want to say on this one as well that there are some cultivars that are sensitive to sulfur, and I've listed a few of them, like the Red Delicious, Stamen, and Baldwin. Um, you want to make sure that you don't, uh, on these cultivars particularly, you don't want to have sulfur closely uh, with oil as well. So the same rule on this if you have sensitive cultivars. Again, if you're organic, uh, one of your other options is liquid lime sulfur which I have uh, pictured below. You usually think about liquid lime sulfur as being a dormant uh, application, but it actually can be used season long at a much lower rate, or well, actually a significantly lower rate as well. So if you look at the label, you'll see um, where you can um, reduce the rate on that. So this is what scab looks like uncontrolled. Um, the leaves have uh, darkened spots. Uh, they are on the fruit as well, and as the disease progresses, it, it ends up splitting the fruit and, and very attractive. So uh, they get these scabby uh, lesions on them. And uh, the way this progresses is the, uh, uh, the leaves that are infected drop at the end of the season over winter. Uh, first rainstorm, wind, then they can splash right back up on the tree, and the cycle starts completely all over. And again, reminding, I've already mentioned this, there are a number of scab-resistant varieties. Some of the newer ones that are coming out are, are quite nice. And again, just uh, listing a few here, Red Free, Gold Rush, Pristine, um, there's Wine Crisp, Pixie Crunch, all of those are, are very good with scab resistance in them. If we're looking at organic scab uh, control options, um, as I say, you can use liquid lime sulfur for pedipole spray if used for thinning. Now, occasionally, um, 
you know, if you want to do some apple thinning, organic growers don't have the option of using what commercial growers normally use. So liquid lime sulfur is what we use to do um, thinning on apple. So uh, if you're using this, you can uh, start out with sulfur. Um, and when you get to the point where you would do some thinning, you can switch over to some liquid uh, lime sulfur. Now, I will say that um, if you have um, sulfur sensitive uh, cultivars, you can switch over to copper at the quarter inch. I mentioned this earlier on the on the past, um, but again, if you uh, continue on with copper beyond this, and I've got a picture of an apple that has copper injury. Sometimes we talk about copper injury and then don't show you what it looks like. And this is what on a red apple, uh, the lenticels on the apple turn black. So it, it actually looks like disease, but it's, it's chemical injury uh, on the fruit. So this is not toxic. Uh, if you peel it away, uh, the flesh is fine, but on the outer surface, um, it does, is, is, it is blemished quite a bit. If you're using um, wettable sulfur um, for other the other varieties, you can start that at bud break and do it about every seven days. And if you're using liquid lime sulfur as post-infection eradicant, it's about a 2% volume for volume uh, on that. So again, a really light rate of liquid lime sulfur. One other thing that I want to mention that a lot of uh, commercial growers use, but a homeowner can or a small grower can as well. Remember I said that uh, the way the cycle keeps continuing is, is that infected leaves drop to the ground, uh, they overwinter there, and then with rain, they're splashed back up on the tree. So one of our goals is, is how do we uh, get those leaves to break down so that the disease cannot overwinter? And so I've got here that, uh, if you take a 5% solution of urea, and I've given you a rate per 100 gallons, and you can knock it down from there, about when uh, the leaves are uh, either falling or media, uh, immediately uh, before. So they either are completely on the ground or they've started to heavily fall. You can either spray the tree or you can spray the ground. The main idea, though, is to get the urea on most of the leaves. And the urea is there uh, to help break these leaves down. So the smaller the pieces, the more rapidly they break down, and there's less media uh, for the, um, the fungal pathogen to overwinter. So again, this is one of your options. And the reason we do it so late in the season is that we don't want to be adding uh, fertilizer when they're actively growing because it might prolong their going into dormancy. So it's really important that you wait until the trees are heavily falling off the tree or they're all on the ground before you do something like this. And I see a little note that says, will raking up and removing leaves work? Yes, it will. Um, the smaller the scale, that much more easy to do that. But a lot of uh, growers, what they'll do is they'll run a flail mower uh, through to really chop it up. And then if it's not uh, moving along quickly enough, then they'll do a urea spray over the top. So you guys, by that question, tells me you're catching on. The idea is for those leaves not to be left so that they can carry on the uh, pathogen for the next year. So let's look at one of the, uh, what we would call a summer disease. This is one that develops later. And usually when we're talking about summer diseases, the first one we talk about is city blotch and fly speck. And when you're controlling city blotch and fly speck, the timing uh, coincides with the timing of controlling other summer diseases. Those are like your white rot, your black rot, your bitter rot. Uh, so we'll talk about how those go together. Here in Illinois, um, if we were looking at commercial growers, and, and really anybody can have this uh, equipment, I've got a picture of a little watchdog that I have. Uh, this is a, a piece of weather equipment that is kind of like a, a fake leaf. What it does is it measures leaf wetness. And all the modeling and research that's been done, uh, particularly for the Illinois area, is that they found that once we reach 175 hours of wetness, and that's due to rain or, or uh, uh, I'm going to say after the first cover spray. So you do your normal fungicides, and then you start counting hours. And once we accumulate 175 hours of leaf wetness, 
that's suitable for the disease to start developing. So we need to we know that uh, we need to start doing sprays at that point. Now, if you don't want to go this far where you have, um, you know, keeping track of leaf wetness, one of the things that you can do is is watch uh, the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News. They usually uh, newsletter, I should say, they usually report on that when we're getting uh, approaching that uh, leaf wetness and when to start spraying, or you can just continue spraying after the first cover. So if you want to kind of uh, save some sprays, um, the way to do it is to uh, either utilize someone else's data from the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Newsletter or get your own equipment and keep track of it so that you know when to spray. One of the things is nice about this is when you start spraying for sooty blotch fly speck, um, as I mentioned, this will cover all the other summer diseases as well. So that's that's a pretty nice thing. So let's look at some of the control options for this. So um, whether you are just going to continue spraying on a on a you know uh, a calendar basis or whether you're going to try to use a model to time when you need to restart fungicide applications, it, it the only thing that differs is what you're applying. So if you're organic um, options on this, um, liquid lime sulfur is one of your options for this, and it, it's usually um, a pretty low rate. You can see a third of an ounce. That's really a light rate. And it's usually it can be on a 10-day schedule starting in July and August, and if you're going to try and stretch it to a longer period between sprays, you need to double the rate on that. If you're being conventional, um, the only one that we have on the home market is only rated as fair to good, um, is Captan. And that's why Captan is one of the main components in those uh, uh, tree or orchard uh, spray uh, premixes as well. And I'll talk about those as we get along. Now, here's why I made a note. If you're looking uh, in the commercial spray guide, you'll see that Mancozeb is in there and that it's rated as excellent uh, for city blotch and fly speck. And so if you were to buy commercially packaged Mancozeb, uh, you could spray it on your tree. But if you go into a home garden center and buy the exact same product uh, in a non-commercial package, uh, it is not labeled for apples, so in that case it wouldn't be labeled uh, legal to you. So I do have a note here that uh, um, even though the commercial spray guide mentions an active ingredient that you know you can use, the label is what stipulates as to whether it's, it's legal to use for what uses. And these are some of the other um, summer diseases, and I think it's important that you be able to identify them and, and which is which. Um, the top one is white rot, and I've shown what it looks like on the outside of the fruit, and I've shown when you open it up, white rot is kind of a, a column. It starts from the outer edge and works to the core, and you can see that it is pretty, pretty uniform in its width from from edge to edge, um, and that's usually pretty indicative of white rot. Um, the one that I have lower is called black rot, um, again, another fungal disease, and a lot of times with black rot, what will, it's usually associated with mummies on trees, so I talked about the importance of cleaning up uh, leaves if you have a scab issue. Well, with black rot, it is incredibly important to make sure that you get rid of any of these mummies. Um, because this mummy in this picture is infected with black rot, and if you can look at the little insert, you can see the uh, mummy that is on that is resting now on the new fruit of the next season, and that fruit is infected with black rot. It has little black um, specks all over the fruit uh, that's indicative of the disease. And so when we're looking at this, if you uh, combine with the previous slide on the summer disease of city blotch fly speck, I mentioned that captan was rated as fair to good. Uh, when we're looking at uh, captan for black rot and white rot, it is rated as good. Uh, if you're organic, sulfur is rated as fair on it. So um, again, the summer diseases are probably going to be the most challenging if you're trying to be uh, organic. Bitter rot is another um, summer disease, and captan is rated as excellent uh, for this. 
And if you look at this, uh, the um, lesion on the fruit on the outside kind of has some rings in it. It looks somewhat like a bullseye. But when you cut the fruit open, it looks quite a bit different than white rot and in that it kind of narrows down as it approaches uh, the core. So you can see the difference uh, between the two uh, for bitter rot uh, on this. So let's go ahead. Um, and look at some of the others. Now, this is not a disease, but I just want to point this out, so I'm not going to go over any great detail. Um, we do have um, some things that if you're not familiar with them, you might think that they're disease. This is what we call cork spot, and this is a nutritional disorder. Um, it's usually associated with uh, boron and calcium. Um, uh, deficiencies on there, and usually these are addressed with preventative sprays of calcium chloride. You usually start those in first or second cover. And calcium chloride is available to home gardeners or home orchardists. Uh, if you go to a garden center like Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, and look in their fertilizer section, um, look for what would be purchased if you had blossom, uh, blossom end rot for tomatoes because that is calcium chloride and it can be used on apples as well. This is probably, I'm going to say this is probably one of the most challenging um, issues for uh, commercial end is um, when we have crown rot, which is the phytophthora on there. And for homeowners, um, I was in a garden center in Peoria and found a container of this. Otherwise, I rarely see agrifos on the home market. And this is one of the products uh, that can be used if you, um, as a pretreatment, if you suspect that you have uh, poorly drained soils or your soils are really heavy. So I will mention that this is probably um, the only product that is available in the home market. This is definitely labeled exactly the same uh, for the commercial market. So this is uh, one of the unusual ones where they kept the name the same both on the home market and the commercial market. So um, this is, I'll show you some pictures of um, crown rot. This is not, this is what you don't want to see. Uh, this is uh, already the tree is infected. Um, there's nothing that can be done once the tree is infected, and so usually treatments for crown rot, if you were to use agrifos, are usually done uh, ahead of time to act as a preventative uh, on there. So when you see, you know, if you start sus suspecting um, that you have crown rot and you've got all of these issues that are listed here as, as symptomatic of crown rot, this is a tree that I got my knife out and started pulling the bark away, and this is what you don't want to see. You don't want to see that sharp transition uh, from healthy wood to dark wood. Um, that's just usually a key indicator of phytophthora. Now, we did go ahead and yank this tree and send it to the plant clinic and have it tested just to have it verified that we weren't looking at something like winter injury. Sometimes winter injury can look like this as well, but uh, phytophthora, um, if it were phytophthora, usually the tree will go ahead and, and succumb and, and death is uh, soon to follow. Uh, Sometimes a tree can survive winter injury, but it's, it's usually a test that will identify um, for sure that's what it is. I will mention, you know, if you're a homeowner, you might not necessarily know what your rootstock is, but if you are buying um, known rootstocks, I want to mention that they do have um, all of them are somewhat uh, susceptible uh, to crown rot but, uh, or crown collar rot. So I just put this uh, chart up here to show you that uh, some of our more common dwarfing rootstock like M9 is moderately resistant, which is good. But if you look at a little bit bigger tree like an M7, you can see that they're susceptible. And some of our uh, large trees like the 111, 106, um, the 106 is highly susceptible, um, the 111 is susceptible to marginally resistant. So again, these are all uh, components of, of um, managing something like crown rot. Obviously, you want to just plant them in a very well-drained soil uh, that's not heavy and not sitting in water because those are the conditions that phy phytophthora can just really proliferate. Um, but you can really uh, get yourself in a fix if you have a highly susceptible um, uh, rootstock as well. So those are just all considerations to uh, your planting. Powdery mildew is a problem that we have on uh, a number 
of plants, not just apples. When we're talking organic, uh, wettable sulfur is good. Um, it usually starts at tight cluster or pink. Uh, liquid lime sulfur will also control. One that I will also mention, this is kind of pricey though, but I just want to put it in here for completion sake. If you get, you know, um, like Peaceful Valley or any of the other organic suppliers is usually where you're going to find GMS stylet oil. Um, it's usually pretty pricey, but uh, put on the tree, uh, it will reduce sporul sporulation. So in other words, you can have an infection, but uh, with stylet oil, it, it, it doesn't allow it to spread on there. So that's one of the benefits of stylet oil. If you're looking at conventional options, the microbutanil, um, this is the one that uh, on the home version, uh, it's going to be called uh, Spectricide Immunox. On the commercial, it'll be called uh, Nova. One of the other ones, and I just ran across this one. I didn't realize this one was on the home market. Um, you know, for a long time when you're looking at uh, what do I want to say, home remedies, they'll always talk about using baking soda. Uh, well, this is uh, similar to baking soda. This is potassium bicarbonate. But what's different about this one, it's labeled as a pesticide. So this is something uh, that can be uh, uh, used uh, specifically for control of powdered mildew. And this is uh, one of the interesting things is, you know, if you're buying it for your apples, you wouldn't necessarily look at this product on the shelf because they're really pushing. They've got a rose on the label, talks about roses, but if you look a little closer, you'll see the apples are on the label as well. So uh, this is something that you can get for powdery mildew control. Um, I want to say that the foliage is most susceptible at night when we have really high humidity. Um, and usually when it's kind of in that 70 to 80 degree temperature, and these are some pictures of what powdery mildew looks like on apples. Uh, the leaves start curling and they, from the disease, they'll start browning and you usually see it in the newest leaves first. Uh, older leaves seem to be more resistant to it. And in a severe uh, infection, the fruit can show uh, symptoms as well. And I'm going to say that they appear somewhat russeted. And so again, from the previous slide, it's usually a fairly early start on um, application for your control on this. I'm going to move into some peaches. Now remember, I'm using peaches, my example, for all of the stone fruit. There are a few uh, differences, but basically, um, um, we're going to be talking about peaches. So this is what I was hoping we would have this year. Um, it doesn't look like uh, we're going to have that. Um, as I mentioned last time, I were talking about uh, uh, tree fruit in the um, Mississippi uh, Valley where the Illinois and Missouri come in. Uh, it looks like our peach crop is, is, is very compromised, but I think the rest of uh, the peach growing area is pretty well. So hopefully they will uh, look like this. So uh, this is one of the orchards I work with um, in pruning and it's something I never get tired of, just an absolutely lovely sight. But these are the same, um, you know, com um, control options of whether you have one tree or whether you have thousands um, pretty well. Now this is the table that I pulled out of uh, the commercial spray guide and I removed uh, all the commercial products and just put in the ones that are available for home. So if you want to see all the commercial uh, additions, you can look in the spray guide for it. So I just want to show you um, that when we are looking at the top half, which is for today's discussion for disease control, you can see that when we're looking at brown rot, blossom bright, blight, excuse me, um, chlorothalonil, captan are very good. Uh, micro, microbutanil, which I'll remind you is the immunox spectricide, is excellent. Uh, sulfur for the organic growers is considered fair. Um, move over to uh, peach scab. You have uh, three options that are considered good. Uh, and powdery mildew, um, you have three options, one excellent, one good, and one fair. So let's go ahead and look at some of these diseases and what your, what your options and timing are. Okay, you have listed the one fungicide as something like don't repeat use. Can you discuss using different group number in a season? Well, you know, when I say don't use repeatedly, um, the main reason when we're talking about um, fungicides today, but this also applies to 
herbicides, it applies to insecticide as well. Depending on how they kill the pest, you know, whether they attack it from multiple sites or whether they attack it from single site, um, really determines on how quickly, um, in this case, a fungicide can develop resistance to it. So when I'm talking about um, the microbutanil or the spectricide immunox, that is one that has a much higher risk of disease resistance development, meaning that the disease will overcome it and it will eventually become uh, useless. Some um, liken it to if you've ever heard of humans uh, developing resistance to antibiotics. It's, it's the same type of concept. So when I say don't use um, certain ones back to back, you should imply that that's one that de develops resistance rather quickly. And when we are in the home setting or when we're in the, um, and it wouldn't be organic because that one wouldn't be allowed, but in the home setting sometimes we don't have uh, another option and that's where um, we really um, need to switch to something that, you know, gives us um, even if it's just a fair amount of coverage, um, switch to something else. So when we're looking at captan, for example, um, it is something that uh, kills on um, a multiple um, side of action. So this is something that rarely uh, develops resistance. So if you have a, uh, an option to use captan, that is one that you can switch off to. Uh, so when when you want to use something like the microbutanil is when you have um, a pretty heavy uh, disease pressure, you'll want to use that for protection. And then when things are um, lightening up, maybe you can switch over to captant. Or one of your other options, if you're willing to do so, is tank mix them together so that you are um, exposing the pest to multiple um, modes of killing. And so that's my comment on why on certain you're going to say not use back to back and others will say it's safe to use them back and back. Um, let's move to the next one. You talked in previous about bagging apples and peaches to reduce insects. Yeah, Rick probably mentioned bagging. One of the problems with bagging is, is that um, uh, for the most part, hopefully the disease pathogen will not be able to get through the bag. Um, and so for the most part, I will say that that will uh, work fairly well. Where the problem occurs is if the pathogen is already on the fruit when you bag it and conditions are conducive for it to continue on underneath the bag. And that can happen. And unfortunately, um, you know, that bag prevents any of your pesticides from reaching it as well. So. Um, you know, bagging is good if you're running clean. Uh, if you bag it after there's been an infection event, then you, you might have created a nice little environment for the disease. So it, it's, it's, I can't give you a rock solid answer on that, but uh, um, you know, if, if you put a bag on a clean fruit, then it's pretty well gonna block um, most pathogens from getting uh, on the fruit as well. Um, peach leaf curl. Um, I just got my peach leaf curl um, spray put on probably the last minute. Um, this is a, a, a pretty uh, uh, eye-catching eye disease when you have it. Um, it is very, very bright pink. It's a distortion on the leaves. They grow abnormally. Uh, the disease causes uh, um, the leaf margins of the meristematic cells to just go crazy. So you get these really funky looking leaves that are, that are really quite lovely because of the colors on them. One of the problems though is every one of the leaves that is infected will drop from the tree and if the tree has to relief itself every year, uh, it really is using quite a bit of reserves and over time that, that could weaken the tree to the point that it winter kills. Uh, going. For example, if you had a weak tree going into this winter when we had such very cold temperatures, uh, if it had not been managed properly, this would have been a year uh, to lose a tree that was in a weakened state. So peach, as I mentioned, peach leaf curl is rather easy uh, to control and it requires either a dormant application of copper or an application of chlorthalonil. And if you're on the commercial market, that would be called Bravo. Uh, on the home market, there are so many different names for it. It's one of the most common uh, fungicides on the home market, so you should be easily able to find it. So again, 
a fixed copper spray or chlorothalonil spray in dormant. Whenever you're doing any dormant sprays, any kind, whether you're talking about oil sprays that Rick would have talked to you about or talking about a fungicide spray like I am today, you want to make sure that the temperature is above freezing 24 hours before and 24 hours after your application. That's probably just one of the safety margins uh, on doing dormant sprays. So when you get uh, a window of three nice days, spray right in the middle of it and you'll have this disease controlled. Scab, uh, this is not the same um, scab that's on apple, so this is called peach scab. Uh, this overwinters in t on the tree, uh, where I talked about scab on um, apples, it's in the leaf litter that drops on uh, peaches, it overwinters on the shoots. And I've got a picture in the upper, uh, upper picture that's showing uh, scab lesions on the shoots. And so when you're pruning, uh, that's one of the benefits of pruning is that you're making sure that you have good airflow on the tree, uh, that you can get good spray penetration on the tree so that you can get this under cover. Um, so fungicide sprays are at every 10 a day interval and they usually start at shuck split. So shuck split is after blooming there's a little papery um, um, structure right at the base of uh, the flower and as the fruit uh, enlarges that little papery shuck splits open and drops off. So that's what we call shuck split. And that's usually when you want to start your scab spray. So again, very early uh, applications on this. So if we look at this chart again, going back to it, and you go to the column for um, uh, peach scab, you can see that chlorothalonil is good, caftan is good, and sulfur is good. So if you're organic or conventional, you have a good option for scab control. If we look at brown rot, I think this is the main disease people think about on stone fruits. It is a problem on all of them, whether you're talking about cherries, peaches, nectarines, plums, all of them succumb to brown rot. And again, this is a fungal pathogen. And usually what you're going to see is this rapid death of blossoms. And the lower picture shows that where um, the blossom is just not naturally senescing, it actually um, is, is dying from disease. And you can usually see some lesions on the shoot uh, if you look at the lower pictures. And so uh, for most stone fruit, uh, the susceptibility of infection increases as the fruit um, develops. So if you have brown rot early, um, you're going to have a real mess once things start ripening up. So this is something that you want to really get a good handle on um, early in the season. So if you go um, 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 down to the very last point as you uh, read through this, because it's kind of going over the same type of things about, you know, proper thinning um, through pruning, thinning of fruit, all of those types of things. Um, you want to target your fungicide sprays beginning at pink. So again, uh, we are right on top of that. The trees are starting to uh, swell uh, for areas that are going to have fruit. This is just absolutely critical that you start with brown rot sprays uh, at pink, so um, very early season. So if we look at some of these uh, products here, I want to show um, just um, some of the examples of chlorothalonil that I have at home. So ortho calls theirs garden disease control, uh, boni calls theirs funginil, uh, multi-purpose fungicide. So again, my purpose here was just to show you um, that on the home market there are several different uh, product makers uh, that you can get. I have to say, um, you know, commercially uh, we have the option of using uh, agromycin, which is a different antibiotic than what we use for fire blight in apples. So uh, there's a different uh, antibiotic label for use in peaches. There is no equivalent on the home market. So that makes this one of the most challenging uh, disease problems if we are um, a grower not using commercial products. It is just a super challenge uh, to get control of this. Um, it causes um, severe uh, um, shot holing on leaves, uh, total defoliation, 
um, and eventual death of the tree if there's that much defoliation year after year. And the fruit are infected as well, as you can see in the lower. And this can, this is an early stage, but if it's left to go, um, it is pretty uh, cracked, just like the pictures I showed you on apples as well. So this is uh, a a pretty challenging uh, disease control. So this one is really important um, that you have sanitation, that everything is cleaned up at all times, um, that you have good pruning so that you have good leaf flow. Um, if you can do anything underneath, if you have small scale that you can prevent splashing from the ground up, you know, if you're strawing underneath, um, you're kind of going back to uh, old school things of what can you do. Now, I will remind you that peaches and other stone fruit, particularly peaches, are very, very sensitive um, to copper. But um, if you can get a copper spray on before um, spring growth starts, that's one of the ways to possibly eliminate some of the overwintering bacterium on the outside of the tree. And so that is something that can be uh, done. As I say, in the commercial industry, they would switch over if they have a serious problem, um, switch over to um, using one of the antibiotics for control of this. So this is something you definitely do not want to get um, in your tree. In looking at powdery mildew, um, I already talked about it in apples. I just want to show you some pictures of what it looks like on peach. Very similar on the leaves, but if you look at my hand in the lower picture, those little white um, circles, little tiny, it's like somebody put powder on their fingertip and touched the fruit in places, and so that's powdery mildew. These will eventually um, cause a brown spot on the fruit, and again, um, it's just not a, a really, uh, again, it's just the quality of the fruit is reduced with powdery mildew. And so we've had really high humidity in those night temperatures between 70s and 80s, uh, you're really going to be uh, expecting this to come up, so you're going to want to start fungicide sprays around petal fall and continue on 10 to 14 day intervals. And usually the fruit becomes resistant to this once you're at the, the point of pit hardening on that. And again, that means when you uh, open the fruit uh, that uh, you actually have a pit that uh, is separate and, 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 and solid. So when we're looking at, if you go over to the edge, again, for powdery mildew, you can see that in this case, chlorothalonil and captan, when they have a zero, that means no activity at all. And so you have some options, fixed copper, you know, that's on the chart and everything, but as I said, the only uh, safe use of copper is during the dormant season. And so it cannot be used safely, even though it's a fair controller, of bacterial spot, it can't be used safely without causing some severe phytotoxicity in the plant. So you look at uh, microbutanil, which is a spectricide immunox, it's rated as excellent, and sulfur is rated as good. So we have both a conventional and an organic option for powdery mildew in this case. I mentioned um, by Toffer when we're talking about apples, so I'm just showing you here. You can get the same thing in peaches. I don't think I need to uh, go over this again. It's very, very similar. Uh, the goal is to plant in a good site so you're not in heavy soil, not sitting in, um, you know, uh, poorly drained soils. Um, I'm going to show this one. This is an insect that you might have seen um, or Rick might have shown you in the insect section. The reason I have it here is because it can be mistaken as a disease. And so you see my hand holding this peach with the black fungal growth on this. Um, what this is is the terrapin scale, which is in the lowest picture, uh, is on wood upper in the higher up in the tree. And as they're feeding, they're defecating on the fruit below. And their defecation or their feces is a sugar water, just like aphids. So it's a very sugary substance. And you can see it dripping down the side of the fruit. Well, that black is a secondary fungus uh, that's growing on that sugar. And so really what the control is is to control the terrapin scale. Um, this is not something that you would do fungicide 
uh, applications for. So uh, if you ever see something like this, like something's been poured over the top of your fruit, start looking for scale on there. This is a secondary fungal pathogen uh, growing on that sugary substance. Um, Split pit, I just want to mention this is always, uh, I'm mentioning this again because this is a secondary fungus. This is one of those deals where the stem end is open to the environment and water can flow down into the center of the pit. And again, it's a, it's a sugary interior, uh, the juices of the fruit combined with water and a nice, you know, enclosed environment and you will see uh, a secondary fungus grow on the inside. And so people will split these, you know, cut these peaches in half and there will be mold on the inside. Again, um, this is not uh, one of the diseases we've talked about. This is a secondary fungus. It's just taking advantage of a, you know, a nice, warm, sweet environment for it to grow on the inside. And so the main goal on this is kind of challenging. Um, we see this more so in early ripening peaches, not so much in later peaches. So um, uh, again, if you're growing late peaches, you're probably not going to see this. But I'll make these comments that, um, you know, when we have peaches, there we don't know exactly what's causing um, um, this phenomenon. But I, they've done quite a bit of research that they kind of recognize if you skip down to the bottom of this, it usually goes through stage one. Uh, you know, they have um, where all the cells in the fruit are being formed, it takes about 30 days. And after that time period, then the pit begins to harden at the end of stage one. And if we have conditions that favor the flesh on the outside to be enlarging during pit hardening, that's when we see split pit. And so when we're looking at um, those types of situations, it's usually when we've had, you know, conditions like um, heavy fertile, uh, over fertilization, um, lots of rainfall, warm early season temperatures, and we'll see split pit more so during those conditions. Just showing you a couple other things about peaches that I get lots of calls on. Um, peaches are like apples and tomatoes and other fruit that contain a lot of water that they are crack sensitive and some cultivars are more so than others. And so after a heavy rainfall, um, we'll get um, too much uptake of water and the fruit will swell and they'll crack. And again, this is when we have secondary fungus come in on these cracks. So what I'm showing you on the left is a picture that's just freshly cracked. And when those secondary fungus then land on this, on that sugary substance, um, you'll see a blackening along those, and a lot of times it'll be mistaken as a disease. And in reality, it's, it's an injury um, from water uptake. Um, the middle picture, I will remind people that um, a lot of the stone fruit um, ooze sap uh, from pressure. So uh, it's not always uh, the sign of a canker. Or, or a bore. Some trees just ooze sap. And so I'm showing you a picture of a, a perfectly healthy tree um, and just had quite a bit of water uptake and it just decided to ooze um, on the tree. So sometimes um, it is from trunk injury. You know, if you've had a woodpecker or bore, something like that, you'll see excessive oozing. But it's, it's not always a sign of a death knell for the tree. We'll mention also um, these are grafted uh, trees. Uh, sometimes the graft union uh, is brittle. We usually see this more so on apples than we do on peaches, but I will point out that uh, you need to manage um, the fruit load on there for heavy storms uh, for, for um, uh, safety of the tree. So you really do need to pay attention to uh, the health of the tree um, in terms of trunk as well. I want to uh, mention some of the other things that sometimes are mistaken for disease. It, it's uh, always interesting when you forget about what happened last year. And these are pictures from uh, the same tree. Uh, they kind of had a rough time. In 2007, this tree had lower than average rainfall, and so we had these leaves that were folding in half and drooping. And so uh, clear signs of drought, not disease. This is just, you know, lack of water. Um, and then in 2008, um, this poor tree had uh, well above average rainfall. So again, 
uh, had wet feet. You can see that overall yellowing of the leaves. They're drooping again. Uh, fruit uh, failed to form. They shriveled up. And again, uh, not disease. This is drought injury. The lower right picture where we have twinning, uh, when we have twinning, it usually is uh, consistent with there being a really serious drought or warm, hot conditions um, the previous late summer, early fall when the uh, fruit buds were being initiated. And so if you have a tree that has a lot of twinning, look back on your weather calendar and most likely there was some really hot, dry conditions uh, later in the previous year. And also, um, you know, sometimes operator error can cause symptoms that look like disease. And I'm showing you some glyphosate or Roundup injury. And so this was a tree that got uh, some Roundup on it. And the leaves uh, look like they've had a, you know, that zippering effect. It's almost like somebody had a string on the end of the leaves and kind of pulled it and puckered them all up. Um, and the, uh, gr the, the growing points are messed up, and the tree is also exuding quite a bit of sap. So again, this is not a disease situation. Um, this was uh, uh, operator error with some uh, Roundup when they were spraying for weed control. Uh, for those of you who are using tree fruit sprays, I want to remind you that even though um, all of these say something to the effect of tree fruit spray or orchard spray, they're not all the same. And so these three examples I gave here, um, the one on the left contains captan, malathion, and carbaryl. So it has one uh, conventional fungicide and two conventional insecticides. Uh, the next one is green light. They have a tendency um, to have um, quite a few OMRI um, um, approved labels. And so this one contains pyrethrins. This is the natural uh, form of uh, uh, insecticide from the chrysanthemum, and it also contains neem, um, which is also a much better insecticide than it is a fungicide, but I think they put it in this product as a fungicide. So in terms of disease control, the middle one is it would definitely not be my preference, but it would be considered a closer to organic uh, option. And the one on the right uh, contains pyrethrins and sulfur, and again, uh, this one, uh, though it's not rated for OMRI, um, it is much closer to an organic option. Um, it would be a better choice than the middle one because sulfur is a much better uh, fungicide than neem is. So uh, if I were picking them in terms of their effectiveness, um, the, the captan, malathion, and carbaryl is probably going to be the most effective, followed by um, the um, citrus orchard spray, which contains the pyrethrins and sulfur, and my last choice would be the middle one uh, on there. So one of the benefits of this is it's already pre-mixed. All you need to do is put it in the sprayer and add water, and it, and, it, and it does pretty good on controlling both insects and disease uh, on this. So those are also options. Instead of buying each component uh, individually, you have options with tree fruit or orchard spray. On that, again, remind you, uh, if you're using commercial products uh, to see beyond what I talked about today, you can go to the uh, Midwest Tree Fruit Spray Guide, uh, which is available on the web. Is there a shelf life for the bonite spray? Well, I would say in general that we look at that if you have stored your pesticide in a cool, dark place where um, there's uh, less chance of breakdown, we usually give most sprays their most effectiveness during a five-year period. Um, and after that, possibility of it declining after that, not a guarantee. Wondering about the effective microorganisms as a foliar spray, will it improve disease resistance? Um, you know, there are, um, there are some other, one that I did not include, Include here that that is available on the home market is Serenade. Um, that is available, and I'm assuming that's one that you're talking about. And those are usually um, I don't want to say this. Um, they usually reduce the incident of disease. They're not actually considered a pesticide in terms of um, controlling them or killing them, but they usually are designed to um, control them to a level that is acceptable. So there, there is a product called Serenade 
on the home market. Um, just as Rick talked about using uh, kale and clay, um, you know, for or surround for insect control, sometimes you have um, better control than others, and that seems to be an, um, kind of a general thing on any time that you're using um, biologicals like that because they do react to to nature or the environment. When we're talking about certified organic growers. And Kyle, you can add comments to this, but if your intention is to market your product as USDA certified organic, then yes, um, if you um, are, Kyle, is it $5,000 income? Right, right. Uh, yeah, if, if, if you make more than $5,000, then you have to have a third party certification. Um, or go through the third-party certification program. Uh, if you are a small grower and still want to market as organic and you make less than $5,000, then you just have to follow all of the USDA National Organic Program standards, um, and you can still use, um, you know, the marketing material, the USDA stickers and so forth, um, but you don't have to have a third-party certification. You just have to follow the rules. So it depends on how much money uh, you're making on that. Now, if you're just a home grower and you're just growing organic, no, you do not require to have a certification if your intention is not to sell anything. Um, did I? Um, you, I wonder if you could answer too. I, I wonder if they're wondering, wanting to know about licensing for a pesticide application too, and on the um, general yes. use and restricted use. Yes, um, organic pesticides, those that are OMRI approved um, or you know for organic production, are also licensed through um, U.S. EPA, and so organic products follow. Um, the same licensing requirements um, that conventional pesticides. Now, off the top of my head, I can't think of any of them, though, that are considered restricted use products, and that is the only reason you would need to be licensed um, commercially or non-commercially um, is if you were needing to buy or apply a restricted use product. And so I would say for the most part, uh, organic growers would not have a need to be licensed, um, whether they're commercial or not, because you would not be buying restricted use products. What is your recommended for adjusting rate of pesticide for tree row volume, something else? You know, depending, I'm going to give you a wishy-washy answer on this because, um, you know, when a lot of times when I spray something is I'll do a wet run with no chemical in my, you know, sprayer. And this is a lot of times when you're not spraying a whole lot of things. And I will spray um, all of my trees to drip and see how much water it took. And so that's somewhat of me doing a tree row volume. Uh, that way I'm just not calculating it. I, what I'm doing is I'm actually spraying. Uh, to the point of drip and then seeing how much water I use. And then that tells me um, how much uh, pesticide that I need. And, you know, it becomes difficult to do tree row volume if you don't have, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a specific orchard, for example. Let's say um, you had a tree here, a tree here, a tree here. I mean, you can have 50 trees and they're planted all over the place. And tree row volume becomes difficult uh, if you don't actually have them in rows in an orchard format. And so uh, if you have a non-uniform orchard, um, I think it's easier to just do a, um, you know, fill, fill whatever you're, you know, whether you're doing a pull-behind trailer or you're doing a backpack, a lot of times it's just easier to see how much water uh, it takes to spray that. Now, if you have a larger orchard where you're in rows, then I would recommend um, that you do uh, tree row volume. Now, I have one other um, comment that I want to remind people, and this really has to do with old chemicals versus new chemicals. And you can usually, or I should say new to the market, you can usually tell on the label uh, whether they're old or new. And we see this more in insecticides than we do in fungicides. And I don't, I don't want to repeat something Rick uh, mentioned already. 
but with old products, a lot of times they will give you a rate per um, 100 gallons and an acre rate. When they give you both of those, that usually means that you can quarter rate that because when they calculated those per 100 gallons, they were based on very large trees and, for example, apple trees. And so we don't have those very large standard trees anymore, so it, it took about a quarter of the amount um, to spray them. So a lot of times growers would see that, you know, rate per 100 gallons and would divide it by four. Well, the new products on the market are not uh, tested on large trees. They're tested on small trees. And you'll notice on the label that it will only give you the per acre rate. And so that is not one that you can reduce. If it says that it's, you know, this much has to be put on an acre, um, that's the rate that you have to use. Now, obviously, if you don't have an acre, you're, you know, scaling it down to what your size is. But um, there, there have been some of our older products, and I'll, and I'll you know, for example, uh, Imidan, you know, was an insecticide, um, you know, that's been around for decades. And that was one that growers would regularly uh, quarter rate that one to, you know, justify um, spraying on small trees. So there there are a few quirks uh, to spraying beyond figuring out tree row volume, but the, the most clearest way is to run a wet run and see if, you know, if you calculate a tree row volume, the best way to verify it is to run a wet run over, you know, a certain area and see see if you're on the money. GAP certification, um, again, is going to have, um, and, and Kyle can jump in on, on the numbers on this, but GAP certification is somewhat um, like organic in that there are exemptions depending on what your income off of your farm is. Um, and, and most of small growers are going to fall in the exemption, meaning that, yes, they still need to um, produce safe food, but they don't have to have a third-party audit. There is one exception to that, though, and that is if your buyer requires you to be third-party audited, and that's where a lot of growers are getting caught. Um, according to the federal government, um, they meet the exemption standards, meaning that they're not a large enough grower um, to have to um, go through the third-party audit, but one of their buyers is requiring it of them. And in that case, if you want to keep them as a customer, you would have to be third-party GAP audited. And Kyle, I'll let you go ahead and make your additional comments on that as well. You absolutely hit what I was going to hit on. Your buyer will tell you if they want you GAP certified, and if you want to sell, you'll go ahead and do it. We encourage everybody to, to be GAPs trained. You know, that's just a, a case of sitting through a training session with us. But Elizabeth, it's a hit the key point, your buyer will tell you whether, you know, even if you're exempt or not uh, by the federal standards, if they want you GAP certified. Okay, I see a comment here. Someone at the Spring, Springfield Center says, uh, uh, Extension Office says that there are several restricted use organic products. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with that, that they are. And so if you need to buy a restricted use organic product, um, you would need to be, um, licensed to do so within the state of Illinois. Okay, this is a question again on, um, yes, yeah, so if it says that you have to spray two ounces per acre and you're spraying only a quarter acre, then you would just divide that two ounces by a quarter. Um, what used to happen is, is that they would, um, you know, an, uh, the assumption was is that if you saw two ounces per acre that you were spraying 400 gallons per acre, well, no one sprays 400 gallons anymore uh, per acre. They, you know, a, a more common rate is 100. So what they would do was they would um, uh, cut the rate and only spray a quarter ounce over the entire acre, and that's just clearly wrong. You, know, you need to keep the same concentration of these newer products. So. Um, on Flint, as you mentioned, if it's two ounces per acre, if you're only spraying a quarter acre, then you need to keep it at the same uh, concentration, which would be, um, you know, uh, what is that, a half, a half an ounce uh, per quarter acre, which comes out to two ounces per acre. 
uh, with us, Elizabeth. Thank you for okay. uh, presenting two, two sessions for us this year. And uh, this will end our, our series for this winter. So with that, I think we'll sign off here today. So thanks.